Hello, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us at Space Cowboy Books Online. I am your host, Jean-Paul Garnier, and tonight we are here to celebrate Samantha Mills and her debut novel, The Wings Upon Her Back. Samantha Mills has published a dozen short stories since 2018. In 2023, she received the Nebula, Locus, and Theodore Sturgeon Memorial Award for her short story, Rabbit Test. Mills has also been nominated for the Pushcart Prize, appeared on the British Science Fiction Award longlist multiple times, and was included in the New Voices of Science Fiction from Tachyon Publications. Her fiction has been published in Uncanny Magazine, Beneath Ceaseless Skies, Strange Horizons, Escape Pod, and others. A graduate of the University of Santa Cruz with a BA in Pre- and Early Modern Literature, Mills also received a Master's in Information and Library Science from San Jose State University. In the other half of her life, she is a trained archivist specializing in primary documents with a particular focus on helping local historical societies and research libraries preserve and manage their collections. Mills grew up in Southern California, where she still lives with her family and cats. When she isn't working, writing, or taking care of children, she's watching B-movies, binding books, and crocheting stuffed animals. I'm going to hand it over to Samantha to read us an excerpt from The Wings Upon Her Back. Uh, yes, I hemmed and hawed a little bit over which portion to read today and then finally decided uh, to just start at the beginning because it's going to give us the, the world building backstory. I think that we need to make the rest of the conversation make sense. So chapter one. In the beginning, there was a city of stone and sod, the people of humble means, a home in a valley of no consequence. And then the gods came. St. Lemain, A History, Volume 1. On the night that winged Zemeli fell from grace, a cold wind was blowing from the east. She would remember that wind later, the wind of her last flight, and in her memory she would describe an extra chill to the air, animalistic and biting. At the time it was a downslope breeze like any other, and she didn't spare it another thought. Zemeli was flying back to Redesda after a month patrolling the eastern border. Her back was hot, aching beneath the press and pull of her mechanical wings. Her thoughts were occupied by a long catalog of physical complaints. Knees bad, hips very bad. She was too tired to thank the wind. Ahead, faint glimmers of light peeked through the midnight cloud cover. She saw orange, red, gold, flame colors without the fire. No other city in the world could boast that sight. No other city was blessed the way that Redesda was blessed. Those fireless flames were portals, gateways to another realm. And on the other side of their strange and slippery light, there were five gods, fast asleep. Zemelai loved the fifth of their number, the Mecha god, patron of the city's warriors and keeper of the law. In order to serve her god and keep her city safe, Zemelai had to leave both behind and spend long shifts in the mountains, flying the border till her wings were practically hot enough to melt the implants in her back. She was tired of it. She was tired. It was in this state that Zemelai arrived, exhausted and smelling of hot metal, at Tower Kemiana, the heart of the warrior sect. Twenty-five stories of brick, wood, and metal reaching all the way up to the Mecha God's portal, a marvel within a city of marvels. Zemelai checked in at the 23rd floor watch balcony as expected. She had an argument there, less expected. And then she stormed down to the workers' quarters on level three, where she launched a surprise inspection. The substance of her argument did not really matter. It mattered a great deal. The inspection was simply overdue, and somebody had to do it. It did not have to be her. She was looking for a fight. It was there that she ruined her life. The workers' quarters were empty when Zemelai arrived. Five rows of cots and trunks stretched across the room, every sheet tucked and every candle latched. The ceiling thrummed with distant music, a party two floors up. It was St. Orleski's festival day. The trainees would be raising toast to his name all night, taking advantage of the extra day off. The absurdity of the situation hit her all at once. Half of the district was celebrating, but here she was, sweaty and aching and in dire need of sleep, and instead of celebrating or sleeping, she'd let her temper drive her to this lonely bunk room, picking through strangers' things. And such things, repeatedly patched clothing, books, both religious and recreational in nature, bags of sweets. Well done, Zemelai, this was definitely worth your time. 
She was about to leave when she found an idol. It was wrapped in a shirt, an attempt at concealment likely made in haste when the bells rang for an unscheduled kitchen shift. She dug deeper and discovered a false panel at the bottom of the trunk, something that should have been found earlier if anyone took the job seriously. Zemelai sighed and pressed a call button over the cot. A harried voice came through, made tinny by the speaker. Kitchens. She glanced at the nameplate on the trunk. I need Chase Saver at his bunk. On his way. Had there been a note of hesitation there, or was that a trick of the static? It didn't matter. In a minute or three, the worker would arrive and fall on his belly and deny everything and kick a terrible fuss on his way out the door. But for the minute or three until that happened, Zemele held the idol. It was a beautiful thing, finely wrought of copper and lovingly maintained, molded in the shape of a sleeping figure with its arms crossed over its chest. There was a hint of a face, soft hollows where eyes might be, and the barest lump of a nose, and feet tapering down to a single point like a writing utensil. The scholar god. The door slid open, quiet as a sigh, and Chase Savro entered the room. He was an older man, a tired man, his skin faintly blue from decades of cheap enhancements. He didn't protest when he walked in, though he surely knew why he'd been summoned. He only sank to his knees in front of Zemelai and waited, letting slip a single soft please under his breath, like he didn't even notice it escape. A prayer not meant for her ears. And Zemelai hesitated. She wasn't uncertain about procedure. The law was perfectly clear, and she didn't pity the man kneeling at her feet. She was accustomed to being implored. But there was a quiet dignity to his resignation, a bone deep weariness that she felt more and more each day, and she found herself wavering for the first time in a very long time. How long have you worked in the kitchens, she asked. His voice was gravelly and low, 15 years. And how many years have you pretended to serve the worker god? 20. She appreciated that he didn't lie. There were no time consuming protests about his true allegiances, his loyalty, some error in her inspection. Please wing it, Zemelai. There has been some mistake. This isn't even my bud. Zemelai turned the idol in her hands, running her fingers over the silky smooth impressions where other fingers had repeatedly done the same. The law was clear, no private worship, no falsified allegiance. Chase Savro was an undocumented disciple of the scholar sect, unacceptable. Those few scholars who remained were isolated in their tower, tending their archives and writing down history. It was the safest place for them. It was safer for everyone else. Chase Savro had disguised himself as a worker to gain access to the Mecha God's own temple, the very heart of administration tower Kemiana. It was devious abominable. But, but she was thinking of that argument again, the one that had led her here, the one that didn't matter. Zemele didn't know how many people she had detained over the years, and she didn't care to add it up. Her memory was a blur of rainbow-tinted hair, cheap mechanical limbs, enhanced eyes flashing with anger and grief and defiance, roughened voices asking what, asking how, asking why, 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 she only knew that she was tired, and she was angry, and she hadn't seen the Scholar of God in a very long time. Get rid of it, Zemelai said roughly, and she thrust the idol into his hands. Chase Avro gaped at her. He glanced at the far door, no doubt looking for the warrior trainees who had dragged him away to his conviction. Chase Savro had worked in this tower far too long to believe the Mecha God's judgment ever fell in favor of the accused. The hall is going to empty soon, Zemelai said. I won't tell you twice. He sprang to his feet, the idol clutched to his chest. Zemelai watched him go, and her stomach lurched. She told herself it was her liquid dinner to blame, painkillers washed down with a mug of nerve-deadening sludge. The dopes grew larger every year, and she was beginning to suspect her guts would give out before her implants did. She felt giddy. She felt sick. For one fleeting moment, she felt more than a machine, more than the mechanical wings on her back, but also far less. Wings meant nothing if they were not in service to the Mecha God. A hairline crack ran through Zemelai's devotion, had, perhaps, been there for decades. She'd expected to break years ago. She'd expected to die screaming in battle or berserk in a cage, 
a fate taken out of her hands, a violent mercy. She hadn't expected the end to come like this, quietly, gently, without fanfare. One small hesitation had opened a window of fresh air in a place that had not breathed clean in ages. Zemelai was waking up, but she didn't know it yet. Thank you so much for sharing that excerpt with us. Um, if anyone in the audience has any questions, please do feel free to drop those in the chat during the interview. Um, and we'll move on to the questions. So the culture in the wings upon her back is mm -hmm. a theocracy where labor and religion are completely intertwined. Can you tell us a little bit about using this as a world building technique? Yes, uh, this setting is actually a bit of a departure for me. I grew up in a diverse court town in Southern California. And so usually when I'm building out a world, that's the most natural format for me is everybody's from somewhere else. Everyone's here for a lot of different reasons. Um, and, and yeah, that is to me, that's what the world is like. But in the case of the wings upon her back, I wanted the complete opposite. I wanted a very claustrophobic setting. I wanted a very monocultural setting because I wanted, um, I wanted them to be isolated from the outside world and for this over time to become like a tighter and tighter regime and control over these people. And because of the history of the city and the arc of the main character, that meant um, really building the religion into everything that they do. I, I don't think we're free of this. I think that in the United States, labor and our concept of labor is tied to morality. Um, I think that we're in a culturally Christian society, regardless of what everybody's individual religion or lack thereof is, and that we place a lot of our value on our productivity. And it's that very Puritan Protestant work ethic that we're all kind of bound in and judging each other on whether or not we think those are our values. Uh, so in the book, that division of labor is um, overtly laid out um, because the people there are emulating their gods and those gods showed up within their living history. They're not there for all time. They have like a moment in time that they came um, to this little village and uh, they had clearly defined roles. And so the people there have sorted themselves out according to those roles, which is never very effective. There's not like five categories that you can put all people into and all of their aspirations and end up with everybody happy. And so that is a great source of the conflict is how do you, how do people fit into these, um, into these roles? One of my favorite types of world building is this, um, is this setup where you create the social expectations. You map out what the society thinks of itself, what, um, what people are supposed to believe and what they're supposed to do. And then you imagine all of the characters that do not fit into that, those molds. And I think you get a lot more interesting look at a society based on those contention points. And so that is what I did when I was building out the cast. The main character, Zemelai, that we just met, um, grew up in a scholar family, which is why she has such an affinity <laughs> for this god that she hasn't seen in a long time. And her parents and her brother were all in. They love it. They love researching. They're going to stay in that community forever. And she did not aspire to that. She idolized the warriors and um, this idealistic idea of what it is to join a paramilitary organization and protect your family and protect your borders in this little isolated place because everyone's, of course, wants what they have or so they believe. And um, yeah, so then as she gets older, where we meet her in the book, she's going to fall in with another group of people, and they are that hodgepodge representation of people that do not fit these molds. You have people who have changed allegiances, um, generally trying to hide that fact, and you have also people that were born into the worker class that have stayed in it but are pushing back against the expectations on them that um, they're expected to, their moral position in this society is to do the work and to not question it and to let this managerial class tell them what to do. And so they're, they love their God, but they're pushing against what other people are asking them. And in this, poly <laughs> no, that's yeah, great. That's <laughs> In the in this polytheistic uh, society, yeah. you've got you've got five gods uh, <laughs> related to five divisions of labor. Mm -hmm. um, 
how did you decide to narrow it down into which classes there would be? Um, I so without being too spoilery, because I love this this structure in books like this. Um, I needed there to be more than one plausible explanation for why they had those categories. So I needed them to result in a functioning society. We have farmers outside the wall and they're feeding everyone. And we have that kind of catch all worker category that's building things and keeping everything running. And then you have, and you have the warriors that are, that are protecting that group. And you have the two more cerebral groups, the scholars and engineers that are kind of like the thinkers that are, that are moving things forward. Um, but I wanted there to be questions of what kind of gods divide themselves up by technology and knowledge in this way. And so, um, yeah, <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know how far we want to get into, into the plot with that. I'm not the first person to have a book where you question the nature of the gods and, and where they really come from. But uh, yes, that is the question is why, why have they come in this little formulation? So um, how did your background in library science influence your writing of the scholar sect and their relationship to documents and the research that they do? Yes, uh, directly. So I, for one thing, it was just the, the description of the archives themselves because we get a little look into there and in the type of projects that go on there. Uh, the main conflict kind of kicks off, one of the main conflicts kicks off because a lead scholar orders a cataloging project. And in the course of this grand cataloging project going through the archives one by one, a student finds a lost document. That is a heretical document that was believed destroyed, but a copy was misfiled and has been found in the collection. And so then this spawns this great debate over um, whether it should be published or whether it should be destroyed. And uh, <laughs> I'll decide them on that. But, the ideals of the library profession leaked into that sect for me. Um, it's that purpose of uh, we're retaining our history, we're researching just for the sake of researching, just to understand more where we come from, whether or not we like the answers that we find, and that desire to understand the past um, in order to understand the present. And that puts them at odds with an administration that has a very strict state history that this is the history and this is what the gods mean and this is what we're supposed to be doing. And that causes um, a natural conflict. I think we're seeing that, um, we're seeing it now in the form of book bans across the country that we're fighting over what history is and what we should teach our children about our history. So children's librarians are at this forefront. Um, it's not just about the individual books, but about whether children have freedom to read and whether we have freedom to publish um, more than one point of view. Uh, yeah, it's not the first time um, that librarians have been on the forefront of this. The Patriot Act after 9-11, one of the big things that came to a head was that they were uh, giving librarians gag orders and demanding library records on patrons. And so it was, if you tell anyone that we asked, there's no warrant, if you tell anyone we asked for this, you could go to prison. And a bunch of librarians broke rank and challenged it in court anyway, hoping that they would win and not end up in prison for defying the FBI. But even the people that did not have the ability to risk that um, did all of this sneaky stuff on the back end. They just stopped keeping records on patrons because it was, okay, you're gonna ask me for it. I'm just not gonna have it. And um, that commitment to to privacy and freedom is, I think they're doing a lot of good work out there that we're all getting the benefit of, even if we feel like, oh, the FBI's can know everything I do, like not at the library. <laughs> oh, you're on mute. Praise to librarians for doing this good work. <laughs> have, have you ever encountered any form of censorship in, in your work uh, in libraries? No, I'd luckily no. I Partly I don't work in public libraries, which is where this was coming up um, because it was, oh, there are people in your community and we want to know what they're looking at online because they might be using you to, to sneakily search things. Um, in my case, I've always been in the archives track. I'm in little historical societies that are, um, they're not lending libraries. 
I do still feel strongly about the privacy of my patrons, but um, usually on the archives end, it's more of a tug of war with the privacy of the donors than with the researchers. Um, there's a lot of ethics over what you take and how you make it accessible. Like say one family member inherits the family papers and they're the legal owner so they can donate them, but maybe the other family members don't want all their private business <laughs> permanently available and so that's something that you navigate a little differently than than patron privacy so speaking of history um in the book myth and history are are very much blurred together in in ways that affect people's understanding of their place in the world uh often leading to great confusion um what inspired this and do you think this also becomes an issue in our non-fictional world <laughs> You could guess my answer. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, this is also very tied to my to my archivist work. It's something I think about a lot is how we preserve history and how we um, how we interpret it and how we share it. So first, there's just just what we keep in the first place. Archives have limited space, and so most they'll I'll try to create narrow collection guidelines to control what comes in, and so you're making in the in the goal that you're making a fair decision each time over what to keep and what to say no to and if you're in little societies you end up getting to know everybody in your in your state like in your city like anyone in your region so that if something comes to you that you cannot take you can at least try to refer them to somewhere that it makes more sense and then this will also help researchers because it'll be like oh all this information's in one spot on this one you know subset of the community uh, but what ends up happening is you get a lot of specialized history where everybody has like a little piece of that big picture and they're all looking at the history of the region through through one lens, whether it's, um, um, I've been at like an LGBT archives I worked for a while and that was, you know, that was that slice of history from 50s, 60s on. And then, you know, or smaller, smaller cultural groups and it's that big picture that is the problem because there is no way to teach the entire breadth of human experience <laughs> over all time. And so you have to choose what to narrow it down to. And so you end up oversimplifying it down to this timeline of dates and these handful of big names. If your history book has 20 pages on the Industrial Revolution, then you're going to get a few dates and a few names and a very generalized description of what life was like then and if that's all you ever learn that's the only depth you go on that topic then in your head now that's what life was like in 1700 and you know here or there um which means that when more information comes to light or researchers dig deeper and find these stories that were left out it can cause like a culture war and we're seeing that now with like when the 1619 project started it was that backlash of, no, that's not what I learned in school, and you're making us look bad, and that's not really what our history is. Um, or you're being, you know, that's propaganda, and what I learned is not because it's what I learned when I was eight. Um, <laughs> and so in, we're always mythologizing our history um, simply because of that need to break it down into a linear narrative that we tell, like, stories to like great men stories. And now there's a few women in the tales of great men that formed our country. Um, or we break it into those timelines and we want a story that ends with us. And so we're telling a history that makes sense that leads to where we are now. And so by Nate, like it, it's, it's nonfiction, but it's a little fiction based on what's, what's being kept in and what's being left out. And, uh, yeah, so the, the, the mythologizing seems more apparent when you're talking about um, like religious explanations for the nature of the universe, but it also happens just on a simple textbook that is telling you the history of your town. Kind of scary in real life, uh, amazing as a, as a device for the book. <laughs> <laughs> Um, here's a question from Cliff in the audience. Do you have any favorite uh, histories or historians? Ooh, that's a good question. I'm going to blank on historian names. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, that's good. 
Uh, I like the narrower, the better, basically. If you find me a book about like one moment in history that um, that they can then use to illustrate everything that was going on at the time, one that pops in the head. Oh, God, what's that? Hold on, let me look at my shelf. There was a book about um, smuggling books out of Timbuktu after the Taliban arrived that all of these, God, what's it called? No. I'm not gonna, okay, I'm gonna figure out the name and I'm gonna share it. <laughs> but it was, it told like the history of the region, but in the context of this single through line story, um, that all of these families, their houses were full of books because it was a culture that is so um, book oriented. And then when all of those were banned, it was these archivists, these librarians, oh, the badass librarians of Timbuktu, that's what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> they were smuggling them, like packing them into crates and going at night down a river and trying to get them out to, to external libraries to save all these families' archives. Um, things like that, that stories that you haven't heard, those are my favorite histories because it'll give you one little glimpse, but it'll also remind you that there are so many thousands upon thousands of these stories out there that just are historical oddities that there isn't room for in your classroom textbook. I should make a list <laughs> that sounds amazing i just dropped a link to that book in the uh, okay. in, in the it, chat it's good. Yeah. I'm a, it's i have to get a copy of that scary. too <laughs> <laughs> um so switching gears a little bit here uh much of the conflict for the for the protagonist arises from a sense of duty to one's family uh versus duty to one's profession and or their sect um and the compromises that arise from that very conflict can you tell us about using this device as a, a source of drama in fiction? Yes. So uh, on a very, very small scale, I think a lot of us feel that tug of war. I know that um, for me, the decision to, you know, the, just simply the decision to have a career and also have children already puts you a bit at odds that to spend more time with one is to take time away from the other. And if you're lucky, that's all it is. It's just like your time management skills. Uh, in the book, that gets um, extremely amplified by the antagonist. So when Zemelai is a teenager, she, a young teen, I think 13, she joins the warriors. And so she gets put with a mentor who's going to train her. And that woman, Badaya, ends up becoming, rising up within the sect. She becomes like their, the voice of their god and also dictator over the whole city when the warriors make their move. And she is like deliberately using that isolation tactic that um, all of your allegiances need to be here. Um, her family literally becomes the enemy because they're on opposite sides of this conflict. And it's also just an exploration of that as an abusive dynamic of um, that level of controlling behavior that isolates somebody from their support network. And so, what's a very personal struggle of my family or my, you know, my, my birth family or my new family becomes a very literal like civil war struggle of we're on opposite sides of this conflict. I'm doing this to protect them, but they're not seeing it the same way. And um, that is yes, a source of drama. <laughs> and I don't expect you to fully know the answer to this or if anyone does, but <laughs> okay. you know, what do you think is the mechanism that often uh, leads a sect or a benign religious group uh, into becoming a high control group? Um, I do think that I have thought about, I don't, it's not gonna be obviously the, the answer to end all answers, but I think there is a core insecurity that, um, that your way of life is gonna be challenged. And once it becomes isolated and outside influences become kind of the enemy, of their trying to change us, it really leaves bad actors a, a very easy role to assume where they are the strong leader who is going to keep those bad elements at bay. And um, in order to prove yourself within that group, um, the path gets narrower and narrower because um, in order to prove yourself, there has to be some threat of being kicked out. And if you have to occasionally have an example of that in order to keep everyone else on their toes. And so it's going, the more people fall in line, the, the smaller and smaller problems you have to find in order to, to threaten them with, of, you know, that was too easy to comply with. Well, here's like, 
these circumstances that get narrower and narrower. And so left alone, um, if there's that toxic element, it's just gonna kind of spiral down. <laughs> no good. <laughs> and that could be anywhere. It could be um, a, a work environment. It could be a family. It could be a literal cult that has driven off into the desert in a compound um, and are trying to convince everybody there's nowhere to go. So, <laughs> I don't know if that's, if that's the answer you're looking for. <laughs> I don't know if there's a right answer. I don't, I don't, know, I don't know it either, but it, it's a fascinating uh, <laughs> transition. Um, and, and in reading the afterword to the book, I, I started thinking about high control groups and, you know, as you talked about um, uh, abusers and what it what it does to mm -hmm. the psyche of those involved. Um, so changing gears again, um, in, in grand science fiction and fantasy tradition, uh, all the chapters in this book begin with excerpts from fictitious books and documents, which I just absolutely adore. I've been making a, a catalog of fictitious books. <laughs> um, were these written as part of the chapters or did you plan out the text and write them separately? And uh, has your work as a librarian inspired this cross-referencing of, of fictional text? I also love it. I love books that open with weird quotes made of stuff. I like it when it's real stuff. I like it when it's made up for it. I think it's just such a great, it's such a great way to just stuff in more world building without dragging people through very long classroom scenes or, um, or just somebody turning to someone else and just stating their history in a weird way that um, is not a natural way for people to speak. Um, yeah, these, these in particular came later in the process. I hope that I've integrated them in a way that they feel like they've been there from the beginning, but they, they actually came, uh, pretty late to me in the first couple of drafts. I, uh, was so focused on just making the two timelines work. It was just trying to coordinate, um, Demo as a youth. And as an adult and making those match up in a way that she's on the same the same shape arc like if i was mapping out the book i can visualize it as a graph it doesn't make any sense but there's like a mathematical function that's resulted in the way that the chapters are laid out uh but then once i was editing and tightening things up and drawing out that theme work because i like to get that first thing down and then kind of step back from it and go what did my subconscious kick in here and how can i how can i draw that out more and um, it turns out that the book was about intergenerational trauma and cycles of abuse and history repeating itself. And so at that point, um, I decided to have some fun and make a third story that's embedded in the chapter epigraphs and the interludes that's um, hinting at where this all started and how many people have been down this road before, that it's very much um, a disillusionment arc that um, she came into this just completely starry-eyed and idealistic and then realized that these values she was aspiring to maybe did not come from the place that she thought and then coming coming to a new, more nuanced understanding of her place in this society. And so, so in wrangling the world building, then I had the entire city going through the same grief process that they feel abandoned by their gods and I started writing out this, the essay that ended up being so integral to it. I was like, well, why not include the whole dang essay? And I divided it into five parts and I divided the chapters into 26 chapters. So there's four sets of five and then a last one that's six when it breaks. And please notice it, it was so hard to do. <laughs> but that is, that is what I did. And so I needed so I needed them to not only fit into those pivot, I needed the pivot points to happen at regular intervals. And I also needed the substance of the interlude to thematically make sense at those moments. And so the arguments in the essay um, are the sequence of realizations that she has that leads her to finally understanding, you know, what all of this means in her life. So yeah, for as far as libraries go, um, I just wrote things the way that I like to find documents where there's always fragments. There are always bits with no attribution where you're like, I know this is from this general time period, but I've got no date and I've got no name. And so I'm trying to organize it the best that I can. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> I used my 
my years of reading of reading old documents to write some more documents for my book. So this isn't a question uh, per se, mm -hmm. but uh, a round of applause. Um, it did work. Uh, oh, yeah. it, it was totally <laughs> fabulous. And with the uh, for the potential uh, readers uh, watching this, um, the the overlapping timelines, which take place uh, roughly twenty years apart, um, uh, come together so beautifully in very exciting multiple climax. <laughs> um, the the book got more and more exciting as, as it goes on. Um, so uh, praise to the book on that one. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, my favorite character, and I hesitate to call it a character because it's almost more of a part of the setting, um, mm. but uh, in, in the book, there's an entity called the God Tree. Um, can you tell us about this element of the book, what inspired it, and, and how it works? Because it, it's part biological, it's part tech, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a mediator. Um, but I, I just loved this this uh, device. Thank you. Um, I... So I love science fantasy because I like to not be bound by by one or the other. You know, you can just mash in all the elements that you want. And in this, you know, is it magic? Is it technology? In this case, um, I, as I said, the gods are divided up by knowledge bases and technology. And sometimes they'll give to their followers. And what they give them is literally schematics. Um, and the humans were originally, you know, it was a little village in the mountains when they first came. And when we come in, that their society is a lot more advanced. They're modifying their own bodies to try to be more like the gods. So there's like a mechanical cyborg-y type element. Um, but their understanding of them is they can't, they can't, they can't entirely understand these beings. And so I wanted uh, like the structure, like the, the physical city to reflect that. Um, so we have these towers, the five towers, when the gods retreated, they could still see the portals in the sky and they were so desperate to get back to them that they built towers all the way up to reach them. And those are fun. They're different materials every few stories because if they ran out of something, they wouldn't stop. They figured out something else and they kept going. And I, and they're 25 stories because everyone's five, 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 obsessed with fives. And I like the idea of the Mecha God's tower almost making it there and being just a little shy but them being um so obsessed with everything being perfect that they're not going to build another floor and they're not going to build like a, a ladder would be pathetic and so they end up installing this tree that reaches the rest of the way up um there are hints in the epigraphs about it not working at first that the first people that reached it just sort of bashed themselves against it trying to get through and people died until one of the gods woke up and took pity on them and gave them instructions on how to summon them and open it if they really need to and so it's that's what they then install into this living tree on this each tower is a little different but on this tower they've installed the actual mechanics into the tree and the leader plugs himself into it to speak the words that the gods gave them and give instructions and whether it's purely a mechanical process or these are magic words that the gods can hear in their sleep and wake up, <laughs> who can say? <laughs> so I love the idea of, of um, schematics as part of religious text. You're, in writing, a way, you're, you're writing, you're writing, and ooh, it's a, it's a diagram. <laughs> it, it, it reminds me of one of my favorite books, A Canical for Leibowitz, um, which does a oh, wonderful a job. Yeah. Oh, you, you'll love okay. it. Okay. Um, but it, it brings me to a question, um, because you've mentioned several times using um, math and numerical structures uh, to, to um, structure the literature itself. Can you tell us about how this process works for you? Well, this is one where I realized I was close enough to it to reach for it. And so I just kept, and so I, I, I wrangled it all down. Um, I envisioned the plot uh, like, like two seesaws, like if you were graphing out the up and down of the arcs, this is going to sound like this is going to be nonsense, but I'm going to try. The, the in one timeline, everything's on the up for her, and then we reach this middle pivot point, and it's all downhill for her from there. And then the other one's the opposite, that her life is completely falling apart until she hits rock bottom, and then it's up from there. And then they meet on the graph. <laughs> I don't know how to show that with my hands. They meet on the graph at this overlap point. Um, and so everything I was trying to wrangle the chapter structure the way I want, it looks very nice on a 
on a tree, like on a table of contents. Um, and also have the arc, the pacing of it, meet this up, down, down, up. <laughs> it makes sense in my head. <laughs> and I think you can, I hope you can like feel it in the book, even if you don't know why the pacing, like that it's not the simple three act structure. I guess it's kind of a five act structure with a midpoint. So <laughs> I made it up. <laughs> I made up the structure. <laughs> So when you're outlining, um, do yeah. you actually make graphs and stuff to to keep all of this sort of thing in order? Uh, I don't make the actual, yeah, I didn't graph it, like graph it, but I will color code um, so I can kind of zoom out and see see the patterns. And so in this case, you know, I had the codes by the timelines and um, and then big headings to show me the, the points where it breaks up. And so I could see, oh, I need more here. I need less there to make these um, plot points balance out. Super cool. Um, so The Wings Upon Her Back is your debut novel. Mm -hmm. um, but you've, all, you've also been quite successful as a writer of short fiction. Um, how does the process of writing short versus long form differ for you? Um, and do you have a preference? Which do you like more? And when do you reach for one versus another, depending on what kind of story you want to tell? Um, yes, it's my first book published, but definitely not my first book. I started writing books first before I learned how to write short fiction. Short fiction is so much harder. It's extremely gratifying when you can nail it. But I have a lot of junk in my folders where I was reaching for something and it just did not happen. And now nobody gets to see them. Uh, I, they've definitely influenced each other process is similar how I start um but the brain space I have to be in for them is so different that I can't do them at the same time so I, if I spend a year on a book that means I'm not going to write any short fiction that year which is unfortunate but I got the brain I've got <laughs> um I'll start on paper is where I'll brainstorm because it's more malleable and um it's okay if my idea is conflict with each other because it's not set in stone yet and then once I have enough content that I have either I know right away whether it's going to be a short or a long idea I don't think I've had anything that I thought was one that turned into the other my short stories are pretty much climaxes with enough um backstory trickled in that the climax makes sense uh, if it's something that I want to explore multiple viewpoints and get that extra nuance that you get with a full cast of characters who are all in conflict over something, then that's a book idea to me because I, um, I can either do the timelines or I can do the points of view. This, uh, this book in particular was unusual for me in having such a central main character that the narrative stays stuck on the whole time. I really like multi-point of view. And so that's what I'm going back to for my next thing. But um, yeah, the the book background, I think, influenced the shorts in that some of my ideas do feel like the end of a book, I think, and that I'm trying to reach for those big stakes and challenge myself to how, how much can I pack into 6,000 words? Um, can I jump all over history? And, you know, if they say you should only have two or three characters, I go, well, I'm going to make a character that has five sisters and <laughs> there's nothing you can do to stop me uh and i just i just like it for its experimental nature that you're committing for 20 pages you can try out strange things and if they fail okay it wasn't that much time of my life for it to fail but if it worked oh there's a new tool in my arsenal and maybe i can use it in a bigger work and then vice versa Short fiction taught me how to be a lot more precise with prose, where I had been writing these big rambling things that had good ideas, but way too many scenes, <laughs> and um, just following people from minute to minute and not knowing how to time jump effectively to just get past the boring stuff that we don't need on the page, that I was just going there waking up and I'm following them through the whole day <laughs> until they go to sleep. But uh, in short fiction, I finally got the hang of, um, of just cutting to to the meat of it. And then I tried to bring that back into long form fiction. So I like them both for their different things, but books are probably my, my first true love. And that's more what I envision my career. And then I do the short fiction when something, when something strikes me. 
so speaking of short fiction, um, after winning the Nebula and the Locus Awards, you recently unwon the Hugo uh, Award. I'm so yeah. sorry. Um, what was this experience like? And can you talk about why you made the decision to reject the the award? Um, it was an unpleasant experience, but it's all it's all in the past. Um, the if if anyone is pleasantly under a rock. The, the brief backstory here is um, a few months ago, a bunch of documents came to light um, showing inconsistencies in the nominating data for the 2023 Hugo Awards. So for the 2022 stories, uh, there were finalists who had been marked ineligible seemingly for inconsistent political reasons. And there were, um, once the full data was released, there appeared to be a huge number of potential Chinese nominees that were just wholesale removed from the ballot and everyone else bumped up for reasons that aren't, it's a complicated history that he goes, but um, accusations of slate voting because there were magazines that posted recommended reading lists, except that it's not against the rules to do that. A lot of American magazines do it. Locus has a recommended reading list that influences the other awards. So, uh, motivations aside, <laughs> there were people that should have been on the ballot that weren't. And my category in particular, it was very stark. Like, there were a lot where it was a mix. And so, it was like, oh, well, those people might have been on there anyway. And it's kind of hard to interpret. But the short story category, um, if those numbers we saw are correct, the entire ballot should have been Chinese nominees. Um, it's not even like I was number six and I could argue like, oh... I might have been on, you know, I was totally on there anyway. Maybe it would have turned out the same as like, like number eight or something. And so for me personally, um, this was just embarrassing. And um, it didn't feel like I had a legitimate claim to that award. If it had been the actual voting that was tampered with, and it doesn't seem to, so I'm very grateful for everybody who voted for me. If it had been the voting, they could have rerun the vote. Like we would have just all kicked up an uproar and either have people vote again or rerun the ballots that came through. But since it was the nomination data, like it's too late, that ship has sailed. We don't know what would have been on the ballot. And so I decided since it was my first and only nomination, I couldn't even just slip it into my bio. Like, oh, it could mean any story. I'm like, no, it clearly only means this one story. So for me, it didn't make um, sense to, to use it in that way. Um, so I made a big post and then this was happened over a weekend. So I'm very grateful to my agent and pub team because they got up on Monday and logged into a long email from me explaining what I had done. And they were all extremely supportive. Uh, the book had already gone to print. So it's still on there on the first print run. So there's nothing I could do about that, but I've been like pulling it out of the places I can. They never ship the awards as far as I'm aware. So I don't know if anyone has received the physical, the actual statues. If it ever shows up, it'll be a weird curiosity, I guess, like this weird trivia for this award that mommy kind of won and kind of didn't win. <laughs> but uh, yeah, as far as uh, how I market myself, I'm not, I'm not claiming it. I read your statement when you released it, and I think it showed <laughs> a lot of integrity. And obviously, this was a wonderful story that won other awards. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I hope it wasn't too disappointing. Um, the no, whole scandal the... is disappointing to our entire community, but it should not be placed on you. Yeah. No, one of the things I think that made the decision really specific to me was this is not a story that did not get attention. Uh, it won three other awards. Like, I don't need to be to be grasping for this one. Uh, and I'm very grateful for all of the attention that it got. And so I'm fine, you know, it's it's something that it's the folks that, you know, should have had their work listed up there that didn't, that is, they got the worst of it. <laughs> Hopefully things will be better moving forward. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and that's it. Yeah, and it's done. Done, that year's done. Good. <laughs> I hope Scotland has a good time. <laughs> well, congratulations on the success Thank of you. that story, despite. Um, so, uh, that in the past, um, what are you currently working on, uh, and what's coming up next for you? 
Yeah. So, um, yeah, I vanished for a while there after rabbit test because I was working on this book. Um, but now it's, it's out. I'm doing my events and I can focus on new things. Very exciting. My favorite part is the writing part. This is all, this is all new to me, all of this other part. So I've got two top secret short story projects that I'm waiting to be allowed to announce. So I'm very excited about those. So I need to write them. And then I'm going to return to editing a new book. I had finished a rough draft. It's a big, messy file that I'm now doing the digging around in. Um, it's my Secret Sea Monster book. I'm really excited about it. I think it does a lot of that um, chewy world building thematic questions work that I have in Wings, but also has the multi point of view cast that I love to write. It has some more humor, but it's not so grim. This isn't like completely grim. There's very, there's a lot of optimism in this book, but there isn't a lot of humor. There's just like a tiny bit. And I like um, something, I wanted to pivot to something a little more energetic. I don't know if that's the right word. Uh, yeah, so it's, without getting too into it, it is just this ragtag group that are trying to escape from an infamous prison island that is surrounded by sea monsters and obviously are going to get in over their heads with the history of the island and the sea monsters <laughs> and the nature of carceral states and how we and, and prison but also funny so give so like cross your fingers for me that i sell it because i really want to write it <laughs> well that sounds absolutely delightful <laughs> Uh, Samantha, thank you so much for joining us to talk about uh, the wings upon her back. Thank you to those in the audience. Uh, there is a link in the chat where you can get your own copy of this book. Uh, contact me if you'd like a signed book plate to go along with that. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, those links are down below the video. Um, thank you for the audience to, to for providing some questions. Um, and I hope everyone has a wonderful night. We will see you next time. Uh, Next Flash Science Fiction Night is coming up on May 21st, so be sure to go to spacecowboybooks.com and uh, join us for our upcoming events. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>